I hope you've all had a good week and um, I hope you're all looking forward to this week's lesson. I, I, am, I have been looking forward to this one for quite some time and because it's about the middle of, I guess we've actually passed the hump now, so I think we're over the halfway point for the course, I thought we should probably get to talking about transposition so that you then have a few weeks afterwards to sort of mull it over and let it sink in. Because if I saved it till the end, um, you probably just watch the lecture once and then just go away and forget about it. So um, as future band directors, I would love you to know a little bit more about um, why, not just how, but why we transpose. So um, I'll go a little bit into that, uh, the, the history of it and the whys, and then we'll talk about how, so that I'm not expecting that any of you will be having to transpose, um, you know, horn music anytime soon, but you might have a student who's maybe advanced to the point where they're playing in a youth orchestra and they're getting original parts um, that do require them to transpose. So you can be the person to help them through those situations when they don't know what's going on, because it can be a little bit confusing. Okay, so just before, before we get to that, I just want to um, comment on a few little things from your videos. Thank you all for sending them. And um, just my main thing, I guess, is just you can take more time with playing through these exercises. Um, just play in a more sort of measured, less hurried way so that you really get a chance to hear what's going on with your sound so that you're, um, you know you're playing with your best sound. And you, you know, you, I don't, I'm not listening for speed, I'm really not. Um, I am listening for accuracy and I'm looking for proper fingering, but I also want to have the sense that you're listening very carefully to how you're directing your air and to if you're getting the most, the, just the best centered sound that you can. So um, bear that in mind. And um, just an example of, oh yeah, the five note exercise. I, I'm hearing some of you do it, but I, pro I guess I didn't explain myself well enough last time or two times ago. The five notes in a row, they should be played with a space, with a break. They should be played at a fairly conservative tempo and you're looking for five in a row that are perfect. So you're not just gonna go and there's your fifth note and then I'm done. No, if you have an unclean start to one of those, if you, even if it's number five, you gotta press the reset button, go all the way back to the beginning and start over because that's how you, yeah, you're not gonna move on until you've gotten five really good starts consecutive and then it's time to move on to the next note. Um, this is how we bank those good notes and and we just you know we build up a good sort of arsenal of all those good good notes so that we can sort of pluck them off the shelf when we when we need them. But we want to the, the reason you have to do five in a row of course is just because it, it's just the more it's just you're training yourself to do it more so to do it properly um more times than you're doing it badly okay so then you'll have that muscle memory when you need it okay so now moving on to transposition and i'm gonna try not to make this too long i, I probably will go over 15 minutes but i don't want to so i'll just give you the bare bones if that's possible for me um it's a fascinating subject so um the reason why we transpose is, um, well, I think you all know why. It's prob um, it goes back to the early 19th century and before. So before the early 19th century, we didn't have vowels. And I've talked a little bit about the, um, the natural horn before and in those you know talks that I've done about the harmonics. So, um, a horn would just be pitched in one key. So in our case, the main horn is pitched in F. So I've written here F horn versus horn in F. We all play F horns because that is the, the key that our instrument is built into. And, and um, 
horn and F is a different indication. And you might not have realized this before, but horn in F is talking about um, the transposition, or in this case, the non-transposition that's required. So if it says horn in F, then it means that all the notes that you see in front of you, you just read them as you see them. A C is a horn C, a B flat is a horn B flat. So there's no transposition. You're but if you're still playing your F horn, and it says to play horn in E, then you're still playing an F horn. This is a, that's the, that is what type of an instrument you have, an F horn. But if you're playing horn in E, it means you're taking that F and moving down a half a step to E. And all the notes that you see on the page will be dropped down. You'll play a semitone lower. So, okay, I, I think I got a little bit ahead of myself, but I'm always doing that, sorry. Um, going back to the um, pre-valve era, um, this, the horn, the guys, and the, well, probably just the, the men, um, who would show up to work with their horns, would show up with their natural horn and a collection of crooks that would change the pitch of the instrument. So if they show up and it's a Mozart Symphony 39 in E flat, then that would be concert E flat, then they just would put their E flat crook in the instrument and change the pitch of the instrument so that it's now playing in E flat. However, the part that they see on their stand would be written as if it's in C major. So no sharps, no flats, no accidentals. So, so the tradition that, well, I sort of, I come from is, you know, that I play in a chamber. I, I don't know if I've even told you this, but I play second horn with symphony Nova Scotia. That's my full-time job. So, um, we're a chamber orchestra. We, um, play a lot of the um, pre-romantic because of the size of our orchestra. We're not a big orchestra. So we do play a lot of Baroque and classical music. And whenever I see a Mozart or a Haydn or a Beethoven symphony in front of me, I'm looking at a part that looks to be in C major. Now, of course, it's not. Beethoven 7 is in A major, but the part looks like it's written in C. So. I don't have an A crook that I can just put in and keep reading in C. I have to transpose. So my A crook means moving everything up from F. We always start from F and we go the quickest route to that note. So if it says it's in A, horn in A, then the most direct route from F to A is up a major third. So I will be reading everything up a major third from what I see on the page. So that's how it looks to um, to those of us who are from that um, classical orchestra, chamber music size orchestra. A lot of my daily bread and butter that I see looks just like that. Um, and fortunately, these, these compositions were written before the introduction of the valves and were, they were writing more chromatically for horn. So our job as transposing horn players is quite simple. We don't have to um, play a lot of complex lines. It's usually just one, five, one, you know, um, some threes. <laughs> so, so we just sort of sit around the, the triad that that piece is, is built around and it just, it very quickly just sort of becomes part of the language that we speak. So. You see, um, well, let's go. I've got my whiteboard. I even went to the Dollarama for this one because I thought it would be good to um, make a little illustration for you. So here we go. We always start from F. Now, if the part says horn in E flat, what is the distance from F to E flat? I'll just make this the horn in. Horn in E flat. It's down a whole tone, right? 
So we just move everything down one tone. I don't even know if that's the right um, symbol for one tone, but a whole tone down. We read everything down a whole tone. We have to add our two flats. So we add two flats because we're now in the key of E flat concert. And here's where the next step comes. We're in E flat concert, which on the horn is B flat concert. And B flat has two flats. Do your brains hurt yet? I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't know if this is something that I can explain to you and do a good job of in 10 minutes, but I'm just going to go over these steps a few more times for the, um, the most commonly seen transpositions that we would probably see. Um, we do see quite a bit of E, horn in E, E flat, horn in C. So let's try horn in C. So we always start from the F and the quickest route, the most direct route from F to C um, is down a major fourth. So we go down a fourth. So every time we see a C, um, we would play, oh, sorry, uh, horn in C. So every time we see down a fourth, when you see that C, you would play a G, right? So C becomes G, because you're moving everything down a fourth. And G major has one chart in your key signature. Um, you probably wouldn't see it though, because it's not in that harmonic series. So it's assumed that you're playing in G major, but you probably never get, get to play the F sharp. You probably just, um, you play a lot of G's, B's and D's. Um, but it's good to know that the F sharp is part of the key signature. Now C is a tricky one because if it doesn't say anything next to C, it just says horn and C, then you're going to assume it's C basso, which means going down the fourth, which is the, um, that's the closest distance from the F is the fourth down. But occasionally you're going to be asked to play C alto. And that means you move everything up a fifth. So you go from the F to your fifth above it, to the upper C. All right, so um, that's quite rare, but we do have to do it. So um, it's good to have those, those high notes at the ready for when you're asked to do um, C alto and sometimes B flat alto. Um, yeah, so Ed, that, those are more, much less common. And if it doesn't say alto next to the B flat or the C, then you just sort of default to um, C basso. We don't even really call it basso. Okay, so quickest route from F to C is down fourth. What if it said horn in D? Quickest route from F down to D is down again, and it's down a minor third. So it puts you in the key of A, horn A, right? And that means every time you see that written C, it becomes an A. So any note you see on the page, you go down a third. A being A major, so three sharps. So then you have three sharps and you will be asked to play your C sharp a lot when you're playing, when you're playing in A, because you've got your A, your C sharp, and your E. So when you're doing your harmonic exercises um, and you're just adding a little length of tubing, you're adding your crooks and you're changing the key that you're playing in. So horn in C, or at least horn in F. If I were asked to play that in E, horn in E, then I would go down F to E, one semitone, put down my second valve. Horn in E flat, put down 
on your first bow. Um, and then comes horn in D, so then you're playing in A major, first and second bow step. Um, I don't think I'll go too much more into this, um, but I was, I was struggling with the idea of how to test you on this. I know I said there would be a, a transposition test um, worth a little bit more, I think 30% did I say? Um, but I'm really just not sure how I, would, um, how I would get that to you in a way that seems fair. So I'm wondering if all of you would be okay with, instead of doing that, um, one of your, for one of your videos, I'll ask you, I'll assign you like a little simple thing to play, really, really simple. And then I'll ask you to play it in a couple of different keys. So I'll ask you to transpose it into a couple of different keys. So um, if that works for you, then that will work, that'll work for me. And um, I'd like to hear from you if you don't want to do that. The written tests that I've done um, in, the, in the past have always been, well, everybody's hated me after them. So um, I thought we'd maybe just because this year is a special year, we might um, try and circumnavigate that a little bit. Um, okay, so that, that's the basics about transposition, but I don't really know if any of that made any sense to you for a first timer, but um, I will send out some, uh, some descriptions from, you know, that other people have written that might help you piece it together a little bit more. And what else did I want to say? I've got my notes here. Um, I think that's, I think that's about it. Um, there's, there's other sort of side um, topics around this. Um, that as, well, not so much band directors, but if you end up um, reading from an orchestral score, and you might be doing some of that now even for your degrees, um, it's really good to know how the horn voices are established um, in, in certain, certain situations. You might have four horns, and you might know this, but traditionally, the first and the third horn were the high voices, and second and fourth were the low voices. Because um, if, well, the most probably the most classic example of this is Brahms, because he's written all these wonderful solos for the third horn player, that this, you know, the first horn player is just sitting there twiddling his thumbs and counting his bars, rest, while well, third horn gets to go off and play all these great solos. Because um, although, although Brahms was writing during a time when the vowels had been already invented and um, horn players and horn makers were moving towards a time where they weren't bothering to play with off with the natural horn anymore. Um, he, Brahms himself, really struggled with that and he found that the sound of the natural horn, the valveless horn, um, just had a um, a resonance and tone colors, many, many, many more tone colors than this one, the modern horn. So he, all the, um, I mean, although we play all his all his symphonies now on modern horns, um, he didn't write for. Uh, he he wrote specifically for the natural horn, and and because he did this, he wouldn't, I mean, if he were to change, modulate into a, a new key in the middle of one of his, you know, movements of his symphonies, he'd need to either give the horn players time to change their crooks and, and change the keys of their instruments, or he just drew on a whole other set of horn players whose keys were already in that instrument. So they already had their, say, their C crooks in, um, and first and first and second horn might begin by playing the opening or the exposition in, for example, G. And well, actually, it's probably the other way around. I think it was first and second were usually in the lower key. And then if he moved to, if he modulated into a secondary key, 
then third and fourth would take over. So third is the new lead horn voice and fourth is the supportive voice. So it's like you have your A team and your B team and they're always in different keys performing different functions. Um, and that's really cool. So um, a bit, that's a bit about Brahms and I don't even know how I got there, but oh yeah. So just for score reading, um, it's interesting to know why the third horn traditionally is higher than the second horn. Now, over the years, um, composers have sort of, you know, some, some will stick to the traditional voicing and others have just sort of gone one, two, three, four, so two second from the top. But we're, we're you know, in our situation where I work, we're much more used to third and first being high voices. And, uh, and second is, Second's a really fun job because you kind of get to do a little bit of everything. You do, you are called on to play up high sometimes with the first. Um, but the generally the first horn player has to have those, the, a lot of endurance and just be able to stay up there. And second horn, um, at least in the classical tradition, has to do a lot of jumping around and has to have a, a you know, a quite um, a lot of flexibility and a very good bottom register too. So... Um, yeah, just different job requirements. And that brings me actually to another little tidbit, which is, I think it's the only orchestral instrument, if you're um, taking an audition for an orchestra, um, where the list for low horn is a separate list of excerpts that you have to learn. So if you're auditioning for a first or third horn position, you will have a completely different list of excerpts than if you're auditioning for a second or fourth position. So um, that just tells you that for second and fourth, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, if you're auditioning for second violin, there's no second violin excerpts really of notes. So if you're auditioning for any violin position, you're always gonna be asked to play first violin parts. I think almost without exception. But, um, but horn, yeah, that's the only one. I've heard lots of wind auditions, even for second clarinet. They're never asked to play second clarinet excerpts. So um, yeah, that's another interesting fun fact for you to tuck away. And someday you might just find it, it's good to know. Okay, um, I'm going to sign off and I'm going, I hope you all got the Horner exercise that I sent out last week but nobody has sent me um, a recording of them playing that one yet. So I, I just realized I sent it through my other email, not my Acadia email. So I hope that's not problematic. Um, let me know if you didn't get it and I'll resend it. And in the meantime, I uh, will look forward to hearing more from you. And again, just let me know if you don't want to cancel the written um, horn transposition <laughs> test. And if you don't, then I'll figure a way around that. That's fair for everybody. Okay, have a great week and I will see you soon.